And we're live. Great to have you back again. Welcome to the ProStep Insight Days 2023. It's the second session of the second day. You know that over the last two days we've been discussing the challenges of the digital thread. Yesterday we looked at the solutions offered by ProStep. Today we want to focus on consulting services provided by ProStep. It's the second session and we're turning to sustainable PLM architecture. Our last session today will be at 3 p.m. and there we'll be discussing paths to a successful PLM initiative. So we have a lot of expert knowledge in the mix. Obviously we want our customers to get a chance to speak too and we'd like to hear from you. So if you end your full screen view so the video is somewhat smaller, you'll see a comment box in the bottom right where you can enter your questions. So should you have any burning questions, just let us know. They'll be passed on to me digitally and I can read them out to our speakers at the end. So you will get a response then just in time or almost just in time. We also have a survey for you today. So when we ask you to vote later, you'll have to end full screen view so you can see the survey option at the side. I think everything else is quite straightforward and we're looking forward to many of you getting involved in the discussions today. If you've missed a few sessions yesterday or today, don't worry, we're recording everything and the videos will be made available on ProSteps video portal in the next few days in both German and English. So you should be able to access the information you need at any time. So I suggest we get started now. I'm pleased to be able to welcome a ProStep expert to introduce this session. Peter Whitkop is lead expert in business unit strategy and processes. This morning, you might remember, he discussed the challenges of digitalization with us. And now, as I've said, he'll be introducing this session. Thank you very much, Ms. Bauer. I would also like to say welcome to the second part of today. In the first step, I'd like to give you a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about for the next hour or so. As mentioned this morning several times already, PLM, PLM architecture ready for the future as an essential component, as a prerequisite to enable the digital thread. That's what we want to do in this session today and give you an overview what methods we're going to use to develop this concept. After a brief introduction from my side, Stefan Just is going to position PLM within enterprises and tell us how we think about PLM architectures within an enterprise. Then Hartwig Duma is going to talk about organization and processes as one key element in a corporate infrastructure. Anna Wagner is going to talk about information models and ontology after a section from Porsche, I'm going to finish it all off and speak about organizational architecture, and then we're going to have a Q&A session. Now, let me begin talking about architecture. Architecture ready for the future contains the idea, how can we support companies to be able to anticipate future questions? and that way reach a concept which offers the flexibility necessary for the next few years because many of you know that the decision in favor of PDM solution is something that keeps you tied down for at least 10 years so that means you need a certain degree of flexibility and future readiness. Let's get back to architecture which people like to use. It is used quite generally Originally, architecture meant the design of buildings. You could transfer that and say today, architecture describes the design of an overall system. And if you stay with the analogy of buildings, you can look at that on several levels. There are views of an overall system that could be, for instance, the static structure, that could be electronics, etc. And these views of a system are also important in PLM architectures. So that means a question how you interpret the term architecture and processes and how you can transfer it to PLM. Always with a focus on 
preparing for the future and ensuring that you will be able to work with it over the next few years. I like this slide, you got to see it this morning as well, but it's a very nice picture of what architecture is to support. We've got basic technologies which are used and based on these technologies application cases are developed and implemented in the company's interest. We saw that this morning, Digital Twin, in all its specific applications, it keeps on getting back to the essential fact that Digital Twins need digital threads and how the necessary information is linked. That is the key question for a PLM architecture. That means new products, innovation, new business models have to be supported. That's the key issue of PLM architecture. What do we think PLM architectures will be characterized by in future? The monolithic system is already the past. We can see that we now have federative architectures. It's about applications and infrastructures be kept in a modular fashion for application platforms. That means the trend is already here and in future we're going to see that even more. The entire development of technology, artificial intelligence, trusted data spaces, the cloud, just to give you a few examples, are also an aspect which, of course, remain relevant in this concept. Low code on the right, provision of platforms with few entry barriers to continue developing these structures. That's also an issue. For these federative architectures, that also means integration. And this integration is very much based on standards. My colleague, Mr. Fuga, mentioned that this morning. Companies are based very much on standardization. Things developed here in ProStep IVIP. That's exactly what this architecture is based on. Without these standards, there will be no architectures ready for the future at all. And these standards need pan-system models description of information so it is clear how information is in context over the life cycle of the product and it has to be managed throughout the life cycle. And at the end of the day, it's also about new capabilities. We got to see that this morning, for instance, PLM ALM this morning. That's also an issue which needs to be addressed, how these two worlds can be put in context with each other. The decisive question is, how do you build a bridge from these topics, these technical challenges, towards the concept of PLM architecture? Stefan Just will do that in the next slot. But to begin with, we would like to hear from you what challenges or what experience you already have with architecture. We want to do that as a survey, and Ms. Bauer is going to explain that to you. Exactly. Thank you very much for that. As you can probably see on your screen, you can now take part in the survey. If you can't see the survey, try leaving the full screen view or make the video a little smaller. Then you should see the survey in the bottom right of your screen. Please click on the survey and vote now so that we have the results as soon as possible. I can read out the question now for you again. We would like to know which aspects of an enterprise architecture have you defined or designed in your company? And of course, this survey is completely anonymous. We can't see who voted for what. That's not the point here. We just want to get a general picture of what exactly you've designed what you're involved in, to then focus on these points. So, Mr. Witkop, you know our audience better than I do. Which direction do you think the answers will go in? That's an exciting question. I'm really looking forward to see what the result will be. Just to talk about the agenda in advance, information models and also architectures, but I would imagine that processes is a topic that every company deals with now, from small companies to large companies. Everybody has a kind of process description, process organization, application just the same. I'm interested to know in what's in between, finding this link between architecture and concept. That is something that's sometimes lacking, and I'm 
really interested to see what people's experiences have been and we can see we can see yes, results and what i find quite interesting results, is we it's really very don't interesting have a clear trend seem to be really any clear trend. what's leading at the moment is process definitions if i can read that That's correctly sorry if you're dancing down when i'm looking at the screen sorry, i'm looking down but and i'm just looking at also the screen pretty far up me. it components then and we infrastructure. have IT components and infrastructure which also seems so to be my popular. prediction was almost right you can see process definition is something people know about it is an issue just like IT components that's what we find in IT concepts infrastructure is well described process is described but the links in between how business objects are understood what information is necessary how the two are pooled that is something which doesn't normally get the same level of attention and there's not so much awareness of the significance of this information. So that is, in our experience, something that does reflect this trend. Positive. I don't know any of these. Nobody chose that. So that seems to be, well, at least there seems to be some awareness. Now, let's have a look and see. This seems to be quite stable now. I think that's going to stay more or less like that way. It's almost symmetrical. You could hardly have programmed it any nicer if you'd wanted to. So that's a great transition to the topics that we're going to deal with, illustrating how this link between the different aspects is a great entry. Okay, thank Great. you very much Thanks for, for joining in. There'll and be throughout another the day, we're going to have another survey. survey. And I'm sure I lots of you will get involved there as well. that you will take part well. just as actively. That's and that's, of course, so fun. more fun that way. We've heard as before, we know, Stefan Gors is going to continue. And now, he's going to explain, explain to what a company how architecture in general and PLM in architecture in particular can help us to meet the challenges that face us. I'm interested to hear what he has to say. Thank you very much and welcome to my presentation about company architectures and PLM architectures. We've heard quite a lot of topics this morning already and problems that have to be challenged and we have to make another step to see what approaches we have to reach a solution and that's where architecture comes into play. That's what I'm going to talk about now. Generally speaking, architectures have various levels to begin with in vertical direction in the company and the second direction is of course the horizontal axis the different divisions within the company they certainly do have their own architectures they need their own architecture in order to reflect their activity and they have to be suited to each other and as you would proceed therein and how the architectures can be useful for this we're going to have a look at that now. The world is changing. We can tell in various positions. And I have an example here, which is certainly aged a little bit in the meantime, but I still like it. What's typical about this example is that there are a lot of mechanical parts and a little bit of electrics. Of course, that doesn't reflect a product of today. Today's kind of product is more like what we have illustrated here, a whole lot of electronics and a lot of software involved. And that by itself is, of course, a great challenge to reflect that and handle it. If we'd map that in the overall picture, then with respect to the product, we've illustrated that at the top right. This product is today typically called a system because so much software is contained therein. And that is a challenge in reflecting it. Another major aspect is that there are totally different methods in development and reflection of these conditions. Model-based is an important point which is going to be looked at today. You can also see here, one, the options open up by new technologies, new tools which I can use in my company. At the same time though, together with these options, I'm also bound by the peripheral conditions. We've just heard about all the tools and technology and IT that has to be delivered to the people. They have to grow into this and implement all of this. And of course, that is a prerequisite and a challenge. 
merging together that happens in digital transformation. That's what we're right in the midst of, and that's where we are. And based on this constellation, there are two directions. One, the question that results from business, business activities that I can operate within my company. And on the other hand, the IT's view, which obviously has to support these activities. So there are two different views and two different challenges, and they have to be addressed in a structured manner. And this is the point at which architecture comes into play, irrespective of what kinds of problems and what kind of challenges you're facing. Architecture wants to structure and order this. In the first picture, I've just shown the enterprise architecture. The enterprise architecture in this context is to be broken down in different levels, different main levels, directions which are to be assessed. The key point in our enterprise architecture is that the whole company has to be observed. Accordingly, the view reaches or starts from top management level and follows a top-down approach. Of course, the whole company has to be taken into account then, but that includes that the different divisions, which are illustrated on the right-hand side listed here, have to be picked up. And that's why I'd end up with a bottom-up approach. You really have to pick them up so that you result in a whole picture, and that is the challenge. In our day-to-day -day work, if you look at the PLM architecture in the next picture, the PLM architecture is, of course, part of the company architecture. That's part of it. You have to move therein, and accordingly, for enterprise architecture in our projects, we take the uppermost and the lowermost bar strategy and technology architecture that's in the PLM projects. It's not defined in PLM projects. What we defined are the so-called focus areas, which are processes and organization, data architecture and information architecture, and applications. And this is then observed over the entire life cycle, and this, according to the requirements which can be seen, has to be brought in line. How would such an architecture proceed? The idea of architecture or architectural work is that you define a goal where you actually want to go to. You have to consider carefully what your starting position is, and then you've got to think of a way to get from your start point to your goal. Accordingly, you have to see what kind of options you have on this path, and then you can go. You can also see that in this orange-colored loop on the right-hand side of the cycle. We have the definition of the starting point and the final target. Down at the bottom, you can see how the possible solutions can lead to a consolation, possibly a transient situation, and you can plan that and carry it out. Basically, architecture sounds static, but what is important about architecture is the work in architecture. The architecture frameworks, Fugger frameworks, Sachman frameworks, just to give you two, there are a whole lot of different frameworks which are ready to use, but essentially these are the points which are dealt with therein. And the last slide, the three focus areas as described, I need a process model in order to illustrate a process 
so that details from business and IT can be unified, this understanding has to be given. And that's also something that we focus on in our projects. This understanding has to be given in the company throughout these different areas, where I am and where I want to get to. The same is, of course, true for the product model. One example could be, as just illustrated, that there's a lot of software here. We've heard that several times today already. That has to be integrated in a whole comprehensive product. On top of that, you have further offers which you want to sell. It's not just the physical product which ends up in sales. There are a whole lot of other deliverables that I would like to offer running in parallel. And all these factors have to be brought together. And what we can see and hear in the following presentations is what it looks like within the process within the data and information model and applications. Thank you so far. Yes, thank you. Quite impressive. It was very clear. I have another guest in the studio with me now, Hardwick Dumler. He's a principal consultant at ProStep, and he's going to be delving deeper into the PLM architecture with us now. Over to you. Have fun. Thank you very much. We have the next few minutes to talk about this business architecture level. What kind of dependencies are there? And to begin with, I'd like to go a step back and wonder what a typical event is, why a company would start thinking about PLM. Possibly you've lost your software system because your vendor has cancelled it or discontinued it, or your IT landscape has become so much of a mixed bunch that it would make sense to think about harmonization in order to become more efficient. Or, as a company, you'd recognize that the way you develop products could be improved in efficiency, in productivity or in manufacturing, or could not be continued in the same way because you don't have the competencies to do it anymore. So. The question is, what would you do then? There are a whole lot of things, capabilities, which are summarized by PLM. And the question is, for my company, what's important? What do I have to address first? Now, in ProStep, we have a lot of concepts, a lot of projects, a lot of industries. And as in the session before, we have methodology, we have tools, we have experience. We can accompany people from A to Z. We have to trigger an initiative to modernize PLM all the way to implementation, which we can accompany as well, of course. And that gives us the flexibility that at any time we can join in such an initiative and support our customers. So the question is, what are we going to do? What are we looking for? We're always faced with the situation that we have process participants which are carrying out any kind of activity, generating work results, information, and this interaction is what we're interested in. And in most companies, there's a PEP, a product development process, documented very nicely over time, work results, milestones. That's all very fine, but not detailed enough for our requirements because we want to understand what are the true processes, what are the true problems, and where can we find that out? In the divisions. So that means we get in contact with the representatives from the divisions and discuss all these activities that employees go through and the problems they experience. We gather all the information we need. Now that's, of course, a benefit we can extract from this analysis phase. There's further benefits as well. All our users are on board at an early stage. That means the mood in this user group is not exactly ideal if you just try and stick a system on top of them. We get them on board early, we listen to everybody's opinion, we gather their requirements and wishes. That means we generate a huge benefit throughout this initiative. And the third thing is we can generate unified terminology. It happens quite often in one company, there's a discussion how a process occurs. But here now, using clear terminology and specification, we can avoid misunderstanding throughout the project. 
So what is important? We speak to people who really live with these processes, and along this process we gather everything that exists as relevant product information. And that is this red thread that runs through the product data. We generate common understanding, an important aspect, because willingness for change has to be supported by the insight of the people that it makes sense what we're doing. It's quite typical. If you ask a company what software is the best in order to get your job done, then the answer is often my software. And nobody obviously wants to change things. But if we reach a common understanding that we have difficulties facing challenges, we can generate the willingness to change. What we learn, we document according to corporate standards. That could be swim lane, BPLM, or it used to be EPK, which is very popular. Not so much anymore, though. In any case, we can transparently document that, reflect it, and that way we can generate this common understanding. What we also see as our job is a certain degree of resistance in the workshops. We hear, we listen to wishes and desires coming from the workshops, but we don't accept everything that people say, of course. There are always workarounds in IT infrastructures which are generated by limitations. Just lifting an old project into a new tool doesn't always make sense. So we want to discuss things at level pegging to talk about what makes sense at what point, and that way we want to avoid special solutions because that makes things more expensive. Operating and updating such a system becomes more difficult. So we're really looking at the true requirements. As a result, what do we have? Of course, we have a process model and business objects with which employees can work within their processes. We've got an increased in understanding for PLM, terminology, what can be done, what is difficult. We also, within, within the whole organization, we have an understanding of the status quo, the situation as it is, and the difficulties and challenges. And of course, we can derive steps that should take us to our target that way. We do that to differentiate what is really urgent, what is important, and what are we going to do later in order to reach our PLM vision. Now, I've got management awareness here as well. Management awareness is, of course, very high. Management always decides on such an initiative. But this awareness drops, wanes after time. So we have to make sure that management stays on the ball. We keep them informed. We also need good support from the management when there are unpopular decisions which have to be taken. So in this analysis phase, in this business architecture world, We've gathered this information for the information model, and that is the cue for a second survey. Exactly, we'll do that now. You know how it works, just end the full screen view, and in the bottom right of your screen you should see the survey. Again, this is entirely anonymous, don't worry, just vote and we'll see the responses. So I'll read out the question for you again. So we'd like to hear from you. Which challenges do you see in describing an information model? There are several options because I think there are probably many challenges. It's obviously interesting to see whether we can identify a trend. What do you think? What do you think the trend might be? That's difficult to say, but we spoke about this before already. Process is normally well described. Normally, every division knows its world and its processes, but at the interfaces to other domains, other areas in product development, it's not uncommon that we don't only have a process transition, we have system barriers, data borders. So I do think that this information concerning the processes will be an aspect which will come up here. Of course, it wouldn't be too good if everybody says never heard about that. OK, but that would mean that there aren't any challenges, and that's not a bad thing. So in the approach 0%, that's quite good. Otherwise, a bit of a mixed bag. The combination of business and IT seems to be in the lead. That's what we've heard just now, informing management and making sure communication runs smoothly. 
and we have another three bars at 15%. I'm just squinting to try and read them. That's responsibilities, it seems to be leveling off. Availability of process information, domain specific features, and time spent on creation and maintenance has dropped down a bit. So very much a mixed bag, I'd say. Yes, but the winner is interaction between division and IT. Coming close to the finish. And your number and one tip to solve that? Best tip to solve that problem? You start an initiative with the product developers, the divisions, and IT is, of course, integrated. Communication therein is important. IT is, of course, defensive. They don't want to change anything either, obviously, but you've got to break that down. The communication is essential, as always, when people work together. As a and personal definitely speaker, very that's a right answer, as a but of course, your answers so are right. So thank you very, good. very much for taking part in the survey. That was great fun. And I hope that you'll manage to overcome a lot of these challenges over time. I'm sure new challenges will come up, but that's not what we're looking at today. Thank you. So let's continue on a rhetorical subject. We'll be turning to formally organized terminology otherwise known as ontology. I'm sure you're familiar with this more so than I am, but a very interesting field. And we have two experts with us here now to discuss this with me. Let me just briefly introduce them. We have Anna Wagner here with us. She is a product owner of OpenCLM and senior consultant at ProStep. And on my left, we have Florian Lucen. He is a PLM consultant at ProStep. Welcome to both of you. It's great to have you Thank with you us. Thank you very much, Ms. Bauer. And I would like to start with the key statement that a joint information model in process-based companies is indispensable today. Indispensable. I'd like to follow that up with a question. Why do the information modules not already exist in the company if they're so important? In my view, that's due to two major challenges. The first challenge is overcoming information breaks we have between diff borders between applications and divisions and these breaks developed for historical reasons for different digitalization initiatives which established them further and further and the data silos resulting from that have their own models their own languages and that opposes things like innovation more efficient processes organizational flexibility and the second challenge and i think that suits our survey very nicely that is uniting data and processes you just said it each one of you knows enough examples now how the business world and the it world misunderstand each other entirely and that's why essentially it's about companies and processes and the way information works to be understood. Exactly good. That fits well with the survey we've just had. Currently, as we know, the amount of company internal information is increasing, and I think that that will be the case in the future as well. I was wondering whether this will create further challenges for the models. Absolutely. Scalability and flexibility are not to be neglected at all, and information models should be easily expandable, adaptable, and reflect constantly changing requirements. And to solve these kinds of problems, usually we try to follow best practice. Would STEP maybe be suitable? STEP can more do more than purely exchange of geometric data. It's important for relevant information and product development context, but it's specialized in data exchange. And we understand an information model, though, to be a model which reflects precisely the information that a company needs to achieve its goals. Generally, STEP offers good starting points comprehensive for comprehensive information models, but specialized and accurate corporate languages cannot be reflected one-on-one -on -one here. If I want to take standards into account in modeling or start from scratch entirely, then of course it would make sense to start at a smaller level 
and model essential information and business objects. That de does not depend on the size of a company. That's great to hear. So step by step with step. So then I suggest we move on to the next step. I have a question for Ms. Wagner. So if I've understood correctly, you use linked data to create these information models. I was wondering why is this any better than best practices we maybe already had? Well, using knowledge graphs, we can build flexible and semantically powerful information models. So essentially, every domain and company stays in their own area, builds their own information model there, and then links it to the other information models later on. Then commonly used vocabulary can be reused, and this linking or reuse helps third parties or persons not related to the domain to understand my own language. And linking information models, what does that look like? I have an example from the animal world, and I hope that everyone can understand it then. I think we're all familiar with sloths, if I were to show you a picture of a sloth, I'd assume you know it's a sloth. So essentially, your brain has linked this information. And taking that as commonly used vocabulary, then we can dive into the domain language, a language that a colleague of mine who is a great fan of sloths and I speak together. If we were to talk about two-toed sloths, you could probably follow the conversation and understand that we're talking about sloths because there's a linguistic link between two-toed sloths and sloths. But if my colleague and I were to talk about a coloapus, you'd probably be confused. That's a scientific name for a two-toed sloth. So you've learned something today. Here, there is no linguistic link with the common term sloth. So that's what this linking means. When it comes to knowledge graphs, it's the same idea, but we're not using synapses in your brain, but principles of the World Wide Web to link concepts with each other. So that means I build my domain model and link it to a commonly used vocabulary that is always available online and can be read by humans and machines. And if third parties don't understand my vocabulary, they can follow this standardized link to the public data model and then understand, oh, okay, that is the sloth. With respect to the initial problem, you might imagine that you create a systems engineering information model and a PEP information model, for example. And both of these are linked via a vocabulary. And this would mean that the development engineers could talk to their systems engineering colleagues over a coffee. And in principle, to a specific level of detail at any rate, could understand what they're talking about. This level of detail can be set to any depth. If the information models are directly linked to one another, then the limit is essentially the common language base. And if you'd like to communicate outside of the company, it's probably not something that you really want for all concepts to be understood. And then I can just use the common vocabulary and not convey my internal knowledge. So there's a lot of flexibility in how we set up these smart and very powerful links. Just listening to that is incredibly interesting. So if I've understood you correctly, knowledge graphs can map information models distributed across different domains and companies. But that's just one part of the problem. How do you solve the second part? The second part is that the data are also distributed, and that has to be addressed too. So here, linked data and data meshes come into play. The new motto that has actually probably been around for many decades, probably before I was born, who knows, is referencing instead of integrating. So we're no longer trying to shatter data silos, which have a reason for existing. I'll come back to this. Over the last few years, Doing so has just produced excessive data lakes, which, due to a lack of structure and redundant data, end up becoming a data swamp. That's not helpful. Instead, our author systems and the data silos have a right to be there. They have a use case. So to ensure the author systems work well, you need your data in your own databases and your, in your own proprietary data formats. 
We don't want to shake the tree anymore, to pull the vendors out of their spheres, to force them into an open data format which isn't perfectly suited to their use case. We've done this long enough, something I did at university as well. And I don't really think that this is the best route to take. Instead, we're trying to build targeted openings in our data silos and using detailed interfaces, which are ideally well documented, to make it possible to link data with knowledge graphs. This means we're working in the area of domain-driven design. This is also an area which can be well supported with knowledge graphs. Each domain has data sovereignty of its own data. To ensure that these distributed systems can be accessed, we need federators which can search these data meshes. They can be designed differently. They can have a central unit which knows which systems are attached and coordinates the searches at a single point, or building a federator for each source system which is aware what other connectors there are that are communicating with each other. So lots of things are going on, and you can see the uses can be perfectly tailored to the individual companies and their specific situation. And this all means that it has incredible flexibility. That sounds very interesting in theory. What about the practical side of things for the customers? We at Procep have a modular model we've defined for this, in which we have clear method steps in order to use process analysis and use case analysis to establish a basis. And starting from this basis, we get to work information model. For that, we have workshop designs, we have our experts in the divisions and only a few iterations will lead us to a domain specific information model and then finally we have the formal preparation and of course that occurs in the format desired by the customer Ms. wagner do you agree definitely and taking the approach we've just set out we can address the latest buzzwords of data-driven company domain-driven design data as a product or best of breed by focusing on our information while maintaining and respecting company and domain boundaries. By using commonly used vocabulary, companies which don't have their own information model yet but need to communicate with other companies can benefit. Essentially, in summary, Using data, linked data and data measures maximizes flexibility in designing capability-based enterprise architecture. Those were fascinating insights into the world of ontologies. Thank you and I wish you both every success in the future. We promise to let our customers take the floor on occasion and it is that occasion. One of Procept's customers which works with ontologies is Porsche and I'd suggest we watch their video now. My name is René Bielet and for four years I've been with Porsche responsible for data networking and information networking. As an information architect for systems engineering at Porsche and also as a technical solution architect for configuration management, my main interest is continuous networking of our development network. In CBIT, every employee has the data necessary for his job at high level of quality in his familiar working environment. But reality is slightly different sometimes. Our IT system has developed historically and therefore is made up of a number of data silos. A continuous view throughout various silos because of difficult technical conditions and also different technical understanding of the data is only possible with high technical effort. Classic efforts with data lags, lakes only lead to further redundant data and particularly do not resolve the different understanding of this data in divisions. Also, one tool fits them all approach because of the complexity of vehicle development does not seem to be pertinent. A partial approach for our vision is therefore semantic web. Using standards of the World Wide Web Consortium, our data silos are equipped with a standardized Sparkle endpoint. Also, the technical understanding behind the data is using OVL and Jekyll. 
it reflected that way. The combination of these technologies allows us a semantic layer above our data silos, which gives the user the information he needs at any time in real time. Setting up this information model requires intensive exchange with the divisions and a high level of abstraction and founded know-how and technology of semantic web. Together, step by step, we can achieve our vision for the future in which each Porsche developer has the information he needs at any time and in high quality in his familiar working environment. Best wishes from Weizach and enjoy the Prostep Insight days. Thank you, we are having fun and all the more so after that video. I'd just like to remind you, we'll have our Q&A session soon, so if you have any questions, then do let us know using the comment box. I'll then read them out for you. But before we get to that, we're just going to sum up what we've heard, so the approach to building a capability-based architecture model, and we have Peter Wittkop here to do that very thing. Thank you very much, Ms. Bauer. In the previous presentations, we heard from Stefan Just what the framework is in which company architecture exists and which we have to apply as PLM vendors. That means the level of processes, the level of information, and then, of course, the level of applications. And that's what it's about now, the level of applications, which we believe the third pillar which is necessary for PLM architecture. What describes an IT architecture? It establishes the static and dynamic aspects of IT, and there are various aspects that have to be taken into account. That reaches from infrastructure, hardware, network, all of these aspects via technology, interfaces. We've spoken about that before as well. Standardization interfaces, just mentioned by Anna Wagner as well establish a necessity to look into data silos via interfaces, standardized interfaces, and having the possibility to network data. All of that is important and described in IT architecture, IT management. And finally, from this point of view here now, an essential component is the application. That means a software view. That means the software architecture is a view of a total architecture, describes the set up and the combination of software and also the way software and applications communicate with each other. And illustrated in this chart, we saw a different illustration this morning already, digital thread as a necessary prerequisite for digital twin, illustrated by applications here and how these applications are to be put in context with each other. That means we have to generate information, that's the bottom layer. We have an authoring system along the life cycle, starts from development, production into operations, and that way we generate applications and information. These, this information has to be managed. We have process information which has to be linked. And at the end of the day, we have a layer at which information is illustrated and used for communication. So this layer model, which can be found again and again, in this case is the illustration of information in managing applications and linking this information is an architectural basis for the description of the digital thread. This continuity is always a key issue for us, and the question is where do companies sensibly start? Where are we today? Do you want to start in product development? We saw that this morning. Specific application of digital twin can happen in development. That way, step by step, you can expand your capabilities, expand your information, and that way link information. Finally, a very nice chart I've just found. A mass of applications which the company had beforehand already, and they have to be orchestrated. And one key aspect in organization of a company is the question what capabilities applications serve and might they not be redundant? Often you find there are applications, particularly historically grown applications, and if you have to ask yourself what capability is this application good for and are there applications that might not be united. So I like this chart. It shows you what kind of applications there are and how they can be covered. That's a key aspect. 
So we have to find approaches for each company. We've got to find out, and that takes us back to this trinity again. Which process do you want to live with? Which processes are decisive and necessary in our minds? And what information and how can the whole thing be reflected in applications? We approached this by developing scenarios. Now you could wonder what are scenarios, what do we need them for? From our point of view, they are guidelines for implementation. How will architectures develop in future? And in projects, in companies, they can be guidelines for you to position yourself. Where are you today and where do you want to go to? We have put these in four layers, we call them context, that means we've got a context which generates information, one that administrates information, all the way to illustrating. And what we've done in these scenarios, just by way of example, we have scenarios with significantly more aspects, but I have taken various examples for each of these scenarios. We'll start for a basic scenario that starts with, for instance, in domains, we have information or ontologies, and the question is, how are they linked with each other? And we've just learned there is language that doesn't serve collaboration. They could be managed on premise. And we have classic processes which have to be served, the typical pet processes with classical methods, that's what we call the basic scenario. That doesn't have to mean that there's a scenario which has no future. That's the question which have to back up the company from the view. What kind of scenario? It doesn't have to stay with one scenario. These can also be combinations of further combinations. What scenario do you want to reflect in future? And a lot of mid-sized companies, that's our experience anyway, need to stabilize, optimize these core competencies, put them in context. That's enough work for a lot of companies also over the next few years, even for such a basic scenario. Now let's move on. What do we understand to be the next level? We call this the advanced scenario. Such ontologies are cost domains. That means a certain degree of networking has already occurred. So that means throughout domain borders, one type of language has been agreed upon. Information is not necessarily managed on premise. So they could have at least platforms in the cloud or a kind of integration platform as we have it. That includes certain terminology, which you can specify later on. This morning, we had this in the third part, a lot of companies were asking themselves the questions. Systems engineering, for us, for our company, for our products and systems we developed, how much systems engineering do we have to do? And is it possibly even a process which can exist parallel to the product world? At the moment, particularly small and mid-sized companies are wondering how much of that do they really need to do this? all the way down to the bottom level on the most basic AI applications which you're finding in the way in here. Then we want to have domain-driven designs, ontologies throughout the system to have full plan engineering system based on MBS e-graph technologies and methods all the way to the illustration of graphical infrastructures. As engineers, we're still very much hierarchically structured. We think that way. In the meantime, now there are new options popping up, and we believe in a future scenario that's definitely a topic. And that's why I mentioned this now. This is a guideline. It's up to every company to find out where it makes sense for them in future to use this. It can, of course, be a combination of these different aspects. We're setting all of this up on following a capability-based approach. This is a method which has been mentioned several times already today. For us, the capabilities are in the center of this concept. The capability is a key aspect of a corporate architecture. It's this common understanding of business and IT. The ability to combine 
process a production application. That's why these capabilities are the key aspect. We've developed the maturity level model, and we can say, this is where your company is today. This is where you want to go. And based on that, such architecture concepts can be developed. That means using precisely these methods, we have given you the opportunity to develop these things process organization, data information and applications can be unified and ideally, well, if it works, it would be good, but ideally that can lead to meaningful combination, communication and be a link between these elements. And in these approaches, in these considerations and concepts, we are more than willing to accompany you and we will go down this path together with you. That was what I wanted to say, Ms. Bauer. That sounds like a great message. Thank you very much. We've got a lot of good questions. Thank you for that. So I'll just read them out now. Our first question is, how far have the companies got with implementing the architecture? Different, but... That's a very good question. That follows up on the survey we had before. People are very aware of the infrastructure they have. People are aware of the processes they have. And that's also something that larger companies have really looked into, they're adopting architecture for their company. That's where things are heading, but the degree of maturity varies. And in smaller companies, of course, the strategic understanding of resources is an important issue. So that is why this question matches the image we had this morning already on the process and application level. It's quite good already, but there's certainly a lot of room for improvement. Otherwise, it'd be boring. <laughs> Great. Next question. How do you ensure we come to a shared understanding of the current situation and challenges when looking at processes? I'd hand that over to Hardy Duma. I know what you're saying. Now, actually, in companies, members of staff know their own field very well. And if you look at the entire initiative and explain that, and normally people focus on their topic, but they don't necessarily see the benefit for the whole process. That means if we explain why we're doing this, what we're doing, what the difficulties are, then that's something we've worked on together. And that is then something that increases willingness to change. So again, it's communication. We explain what we do, what the company's doing, and that evolves in these analysis projects. That is understandable. Let's continue. This is a good question, I think. How much time and effort does it take to create an information model? I'm looking at you two. That is an excellent question to which there's no one answer, because no company is as large and complex as another. In my part, I had emphasized that you need a few iterations for one domain. And if you think you might ask the right questions, you've got the right people with you, these are also two important factors, then in four or five workshops, you can reach an information model. But that involves more, though, really, just as an idea. So as a reference point and everything else on a case-by-case -case basis. OK, I think the next question is for you as well. So how does ProStep go about developing ontologies? Well, we share the work quite well. We're a team working on ontology and linked data. It's not just Florian and me. And we have a lot of colleagues with a consulting background from the automotive industry who take parts, part in workshops as experts. And then there's me. I come from a different domain, but have a lot of prior experience in ontologies and linked data. And I tend to ask the odd questions that end up being very valuable. So we work as a team. We have our modeling workshops and we work to get the results. Do you want to add anything? Good. Great. So it's clear the team agrees. That's great to hear. Next question. What do the PLM scenarios shown mean for the companies? To begin with a guide, it helps in orientation. What I mentioned was the aspects therein cover the capability map very nicely. That means the capability map gives you the possibility to position all these aspects 
and see what degree of maturity they've reached. Here, the maturity would be far to the right, and these are companies which are clearly trying to position themselves as leading edge. They address these topics. Otherwise, a company might say they're sufficiently serviced if they're just followers, then they're aware of their basics. They might see this a bit differently. But these capabilities, degrees of maturity, they help you to assess what makes sense for you, how far do you want to go, because behind each step there are things that have to be done. That means effort and resources you have to invest, and that takes you back to do we have them in a company even. So developing a roadmap is the main result, and that's all focused on these scenarios. Great. Thank you very much to the whole team. Those were great talks and you've answered all our questions and we're on time. So I don't think it could have gone any better. I'd like to thank everyone watching for getting involved as well. We have one more session for you today where you can listen and ask questions. At 3pm we'll discuss the path you probably should take to be successful with a PLM initiative. We'll record everything, so if you miss anything or you can't come to the last session, don't worry. We'll be uploading videos of the sessions in the next few days to ProSteps Videos Portal in German and English. See you at 3pm. Thank you.